Welcome to the Alaska Weather Show. I'm meteorologist Peter Chan, coming to you from the National Weather Service through a unique partnership with Alaska Public Media. It is Saturday, January 21st, 2023. If you'd like additional weather information on top of what I provide, you can go to weather.gov. It'll bring up a map of the continental U.S., whereby you can click anywhere on here and get forecast for any place in the nation, watches, warnings, advisories, if they are in effect. A quick check of the map this Sunday afternoon. Nothing major going on across the lower 48. Some winter weather advisories along the Appalachians up into the northeast. Winding down, small, weaker winter storm there in the central part of this uh, the country there around Kansas, and we still have some advisories back through California and up through areas of the Northwest, but no major storms at this time. Here in Alaska, we still have a winter storm warning uh, up in the east central areas. Winding down though this evening includes areas around Eagle South through Northway. Uh, winter weather advisories, there's a, a broader swath of them from the northeast Arctic coast through the Yukon Valley all the way back out toward the southwest and Seward Peninsula coast. High winds are going to diminish across the eastern Aleutians tonight where there is still a high wind warning in effect. And then we're going to see a more active weather pattern bring around milder temperatures here through the end of January, especially as we go through the next couple of weeks. And quick check of uh, some of the FAA webcams. We can see light snow at Eagle picking up about four inches or so of snow uh, with this system. Things will be winding down there where there is a winter storm warning still in effect till nine o'clock this evening. Hooper Bay, clear skies, but uh, cold. And uh, the breezes there will create some wind chills that will drop below 40 below to 50 below zero uh, at times here as we go through the next 24 to 36 hours. Further uh, south, uh, we're to, uh, Dutch Harbor, windy conditions. There have been some wind gusts there. Uh, up around 55, 60 miles an hour. There's a high wind warning in effect until 9 p.m. this evening, but winds will be diminishing as we uh, go through later tonight and especially by Sunday. Cape Spencer there along uh, the uh, outer uh, coast of the northern half, the Panhandle, some scattered light showers and 40 degrees. You're going to see frontal system working its way up in your direction. It's going to bring around uh, some moderate to heavier rains at times here especially later Sunday into early next week. Here are some of the advisories. The winter storm warning, as I said, will be going away at 9 p.m. Things are beginning to wind down. Then we have a broad area of uh, winter weather advisories for a combination of uh, low wind chills and some uh, light snow, blowing snow. And then we have areas out here, especially the middle, lower portion of the Yukon uh, River Basin, including the Seward Peninsula and uh, St. Lawrence Island wind chill advisories at least into uh, through uh, Sunday afternoon. Some areas lingering into the day on Monday where wind chills could be as cold as 40, 50 below because of brisk east to northeast winds. And then that uh, high wind warning for the eastern Aleutians, including Dutch Harbor, will expire at 9 p.m. as we expect the winds to gradually diminish here as we go through uh, the overnight. But in satellite imagery, here's the next uh, weather system coming out. This is the stronger one. There's a fairly strong low up there in the North Pacific, and it is lifting uh, north, northeastward, and that's responsible for producing the strong winds there across the eastern Aleutians today. Uh, here it is on the map, uh, 958 uh, millibars is the central pressure as of this Saturday afternoon. And as we go into late tonight, early Sunday morning, you cut to see the low. It will begin to diminish in intensity, but it's going to send this frontal boundary with a lot of moisture northeastward up toward the Gulf and the Panhandle so that by Sunday afternoon, that frontal boundary will be taking aim here to areas along the Gulf Coast in through the Panhandle. And most areas there through the Panhandle and Gulf Coast where, that are populated near sea level are going to get rain from this system, not snow. Snow will be confined to the higher elevations in some of the coastal mountains. Still have some lighter snow showers there up along the Arctic coast. And then back out here into the Bering, there's that uh, trough that lingers. So by Monday afternoon, weakening low pressures extend from along the northwestern Gulf Coast into northwest Canada. And uh, they'll be uh, continuing to be 
Some pockets of rain, though, not quite as, as uh, substantial as the round coming through uh, as we go through uh, later Sunday and into early Monday. But overall, this pattern is going to continue with lows lifting out of the North Pacific, either impacting the Gulf or coming up into the Bering Sea. And as the pattern shifts around so that the mid and upper level winds turn more south and southwesterly, that's going to allow temperatures to warm across uh, much of the mainland, especially the west side of the state. So lows tonight stay generally above freezing through the lower half, the panhandle. 7 below up at Glen Allen, 27 below there at McGrath. So there's definitely cold air on the other side of the Alaska range. Uh, temperatures Sunday afternoon stay in the 20s, uh, Anchorage Bowl, but uh, 30, mid 30s, uh, even near 40 at Kodiak, and certainly some 40s there in the lower portion of and the outer areas of the panhandle. And then Monday morning, again, lows generally above freezing uh, south of Juneau and especially out toward the outer coast of the panhandle. Uh, readings maybe not quite as cold there at McGrath, 19 below. And then uh, we should start to see uh, readings back up around or maybe a tad above 30 in Anchorage, lower 40s along the outer and southern portions of uh, the panhandle, including Craig, Metlakotla. And up here across the interior, cold temperatures, uh, 35 below-ish, factor in some wind, very easily get wind chills down around or even below 50 below with those kind of readings. And then for Sunday afternoon, sub-zero readings continue across the Yukon Valley up along the Arctic coast north slopes. So it doesn't take much to keep those wind chills down. Monday morning, maybe not quite as cold, but still coldest temperatures north of the Alaska range encompassing the Yukon Valley all the way through the North Slope and Arctic Coast. And temperatures will remain sub-zero there as we go through uh, Monday afternoon. For the southwest, if you're in the middle uh, Yukon Valley, uh, say upper Kuskokwim uh, Valley, get up toward Anvik and things, lows uh, easily be down around 10, 20 below zero. Above freezing, eastern Aleutians, uh, Sunday afternoon, temperatures still sub-zero across the uh, at least the more northern extent of the southwest interior, but above freezing, king salmon down along the Alaska Peninsula. Monday morning lows still sub-zero as you creep up the uh, Yukon Valley and the middle upper Kuskokwim uh, Basin. And then out along the Aleutians and the uh, Alaska Peninsula, temperatures will be uh, generally uh, averaging uh, mid-upper 30s. And Monday afternoon, we could see readings around 40 degrees uh, from Kodiak back southwestward toward Chicknick and uh, Dutch Harbor. And this is what I want to show you. Temperature outlook here as we go uh, to January 27th through the 31st. So this is the 6 to 10 day outlook provided by the Climate Prediction Center of the National Weather Service. And it's really showing uh, above normal temperatures here across much of the mainland, but centered on the uh, lower Yukon Valley, especially around uh, Bethel Northeastward. And this is going to allow temperatures to warm quite a bit. Uh, we could see some readings perhaps getting back up around or a tad above freezing with this kind of setup. Near normal temperatures expected in through the panhandle. And then with the winds turning more south-southwesterly in the mid and upper levels, this can allow moisture to come in off the North Pacific and Bering Seas. So precipitation should average above normal across much of the mainland, especially centered on the northwestern third uh, of uh, the, uh, the mainland here coming up to close out January. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Well, it's now time for your aviation weather. The particular uh, map features we're going to watch, a couple areas of low pressure will be coming up out of the North Pacific, uh, cutting across the lower half of the uh, Alaska Peninsula and then trying to slide uh, northeastward as a wave of low pressure. Frontal boundary also is going to gradually lift northeastward out of the North Pacific and align itself up. Uh, south of the Alaska Peninsula. Another low will come up from the North Pacific and on up toward the central Aleutians. Meanwhile, high pressure center will be out over eastern Russia and eventually take better shape out over the Arctic Ocean. But we do expect widespread IFR conditions, Brooks Range, North Slope, Arctic Coast, and then down along areas of the Panhandle Inner Channel Intercoastal Mountains to Yakutat, and then an area out from uh, the southwestern Gulf uh, back through the North Pacific uh, and on in toward the western portion of the Aleutians. Uh, Sunday afternoon, widespread IFR conditions along uh, the North Slope and Arctic Coast, uh, widespread throughout the Panhandle, westward through the Gulf uh, in along the coastal areas, Prince William Sound coming up the Copper River Basin, down along uh, Kodiak Island as this uh, warm, moist uh, air aloft is pumped northward, creating thicker cloud cover and widespread precipitation. And then uh, for Monday, we expect those IFR conditions to hold there in the north along the north slope and Arctic coast. Uh, 
in through a good portion uh, of the panhandle, especially the inner channels, inner coastal mountains to along the northern Gulf Coast, the western Gulf Coast, back out into the lower southeast Bering to St. Paul, as well as back into the eastern and central Aleutians. And then for Monday afternoon, uh, a rather broad area of IFR conditions from uh, areas of the North Slope, uh, Eastern Arctic Coast, down through the uh, central eastern interior, through the Yukon Valley, along uh, the central western Alaska Range, down in through uh, the northern half, the Alaska Peninsula, all along the Gulf Coast into, again, uh, much of the uh, panhandle, the inner channels there under IFR conditions. And looking at uh, past conditions for uh, Sunday, Anatovic Pass IFR becoming MVFR by afternoon. Same thing at Adigan Pass, IFR conditions becoming MVFR, but the further north you fly, you'll encounter those IFR conditions across the North Slope and Arctic Coast. Uh, further south and west along the west arm of the Alaska Range, VFR conditions will become MVFR as the day unfolds. Same thing at Rainy Pass, VFR becoming marginal uh, visual flight rules. And then Windy Pass should be able to hold on to VFR conditions on Sunday. Uh, Isabel will generally see MVFR conditions. They will become IFR south of the south entrance. And then Mentasta Pass, generally MVFR conditions expected Sunday. A little further south and west, Tanita starts out VFR giving way to MVFR conditions. Portage Pass will start out VFR early in the day, become IFR, especially the eastern half of the pass and throughout Prince William Sound. And then finally, the northern uh, panhandle at Chilkoot and White, uh, we are anticipating IFR conditions throughout the day Sunday. There is warmer air off to the south, uh, south of the Gulf into the North Pacific. Freezing levels aloft rise as high as eight and 10,000 feet. Uh, there's going to be this frontal boundary that drapes from northeast to southwest with a couple areas of low pressure, one coming up out of the North Pacific toward the Alaska Peninsula, another that will come up toward the uh, central Aleutians here as we go uh, through later Sunday and into the day on Monday. Greatest threat for icing will be out over the Gulf. I would say the immediate Gulf Coast above 4,000 feet, and once you get down toward the lower Gulf North Pacific interface, uh, above five, 6,000 feet, and then another area out here toward the central Aleutians above four and 6,000 feet there further in the North uh, Pacific. Big ridge of high pressure out there and through Western Canada. We have a jet max of 150 knots out there in the Northeastern Pacific. Uh, high pressure area back out towards St. Lawrence Island at 30,000 feet. We bring it down to 700 millibars or 9,000 feet. Better sense of that uh, high that's uh, situated there in eastern Russia, and then low pressure there uh, out in the northern Pacific approaching uh, the lower half of the Alaska Peninsula. And as we get down to 3,000 feet, uh, low pressure, there are those two lows, one coming up toward the Alaska Peninsula, another one approaching the central Aleutians. Strongest winds ahead of it are uh, in the North Pacific, upwards of 60 knots. Back here out across the Bering Sea off of uh, the southwest coast, winds in excess of 50 to as high as 70 knots out of the east between that high and low pressure system. As a result, there will be severe turbulence there along the uh, Yukon Delta toward uh, St. Matthew and just south of St. Lawrence. Also along areas Areas of the Gulf Coast and in through uh, the entrance there to Cook Inlet. We do expect uh, isolated severe turbulence surface to 6,000 feet, otherwise widespread considerable moderate turbulence. When you think of a national park, you probably envision wide open natural spaces undisturbed by human activity. There are indeed such places, but even in some of the most remote areas of a place like Kenai Fjords National Park in Alaska, the mark of man is present. Marine debris is a menace to the farthest reaches of our globe, and even designated national park lands are not immune. In the summer of 2009, the Resurrection Bay Conservation Alliance, a grassroots conservation organization based in Seward, Alaska, decided to do something about the marine debris fouling the beaches of Kenai Fjords National Park. Marine Debris Coordinator Tim Johnson had first-hand experience with the issue. The summer before, uh, my wife and I, Michelle, had done a paddle from Seward, a uh, sea kayak paddle from Seward to Homer. Really, our eyes were open to some areas that we didn't realize there was so much accumulation. It was really deceiving up front. You couldn't really get a feel for the, the extent and impact of it. You've got this, this, this nice high tide line that's 
quite pristine and you really don't get a picture for the, the impact, the amount of uh, debris in that area until you get behind those storm berms, you get back into the lagoons and the, the vegetation around those lagoons. And then you see the, the absolute extent back into that veg and how intertwined and enmeshed um, these decades of trash deposition. So we were just appalled by that and said we, we got to get something together on a larger scale. The Resurrection Bay Conservation Alliance is a local um, nonprofit community organization and they have been instrumental in helping um, the Park Service obtain funding to, to get uh, a boats, larger boats to help move the debris and they get volunteer labor and organize the work trips and so it's really a partnership between the Park Service and the community to help get out and really get a project done that in and of itself any one group couldn't do it on their own. Most of that trash was baggable, however, there were large items, huge, you know, piles of hauser line, uh, for example, that, you know, we just had to hoist up onto the boat. The volunteers didn't just bag, haul, and hoist the garbage, but also carefully recorded what types of debris were collected. In many ways, the debris itself is a resource. Um, archaeologists use middens, the trash heaps, um, as a way of analyzing past cultures, and in one sense, Marine debris is a form of a midden. It's a trash heap that left for the future would be something that people could use to analyze our cu culture. It may not say the best things about our culture or everything that we want, but we need to be able to document what we've done um, so that we can preserve that legacy, um, make sure that we as a society don't forget what we've, what we've been doing. We had two larger categories of, of, of marine debris that we picked up. Um, commercial fishing um, means like, um, say, uh, gill nets, um, large hauser lines, anything that, that would be associated with more of a commercial fishing scale. And then the second category was, was more recreational fishing and household, you know, which would be you know, general plastics, um, you know, things like that. Um, so we had about a 75% of the commercial fishing uh, marine debris element and about 25% of the recreational and household further out the bay, and we had the exact opposite the closer we got to Seward uh, within the bay. It was about 25% commercial uh, fishing versus 75% recreational fishing and, and household. The trash is not just unsightly for park visitors, but also poses threats to wildlife and marine habitat. Really one of the larger issues now that you go to this plastic that has, uh, can really get into the food web and affect the food web differently than something like glass. These substances, for instance, all these polystyrene blocks that are breaking down into all these little crumbly bits are, are further breaking down on a microscopic level and uh, how much of an impact that has, you know, in this ecosystem is yet to be determined, but I think it's got pretty high potential. You know, well known that sea turtles will eat plastic bags floating in the water. They look like jellyfish to a sea turtle and 
Um, obviously, a plastic bag doesn't uh, go well in the digestive system of a turtle. Um, albatross will see small pieces of plastic floating on the surface and think they're small fish and other food sources and eat that in their stomachs, especially in some of the um, northwestern Hawaiian islands. It, they, they'll find dead albatross that have starved to death with a full stomach and it's full of pl pieces of plastic. We're affecting our local areas this way, uh, but we need to be thinking about it from more of a state and, and, and global international on scale. And, and most importantly, to, to try and focus on prevention of it coming in the first place. Because we're just going to see this continuing you know, to build up on our beaches unless we're able to, to get a little bit more of an approach on, on prevention on the front end. Marine debris is really a global problem um, you know, in all the oceans. And you know, there are many different sources. Global shipping is one. Fishing debris from commercial fishing, um, recreational boating activity, activity on land, stuff blowing off land, washing down streams, people just throwing stuff on the shore. Though the problem can seem overwhelming, Johnson remains upbeat about making a positive difference. No, you gotta, you gotta start local. You gotta you know, take control of what you can do and, and, and make something with that and, and try and you know, move on from there. Overall, more than nine tons of debris was removed from the beaches of Kenai Fjords National Park and transported back to Seward to be deposited in a landfill. People gave a lot to the project in order to make it happen. That was um, awesome. One of the most amazing experiences I've ever um, had. Being able to put that, that large of a group of volunteers together, dedicated um, volunteers to put that much effort and, and give that much time and pull all these, the different agencies together to see it all happen um, was, yeah, was, was incredible. It was really incredible. Yeah, very fulfilling. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back to the final segment of our show, the marine weather. We start with the sea ice edge. And there is uh, some openings in the ice there from Utkiatvik to just to the north and west of Wainwright. Uh, there's been some rather brisk east-northeast winds at times. Otherwise, the ice is rather extensive throughout the Chukchi Sea and extending through the Bering Strait. And we are going to have some stronger gale force winds at times, especially passing through the Bering Strait. And uh, we see the ice is rather extensive now through the, the northern and even into the central Bering. The pack ice has made it. Uh, to St. Matthew, and it continues to gradually work its way south and westward. We will continue to see uh, winds with a northeasterly off-ice kind of flow here coming up uh, in the pattern, at least uh, through a portion of this week. And looking at the marine weather here for the uh, southeast panhandle, winds strongest for inner channels. Uh, southeast winds upwards of 30 knots there, Ketchikan, uh, Dixon entrance, eight foot waves around Petersburg, uh, 20 knot winds gust up to 35 knots, four foot waves, and then south winds 15 knots with three foot waves, Lynn Canal, the outer Gulf Coast, gale force winds, a frontal band coming in with rain and some snow in the higher elevations, 40 to 45 knot. Southeast to east, gales and uh, waves running generally around 16 to 18 feet. On Monday, they do come down a bit. Inner channel, southeast winds 15 to 20 knots. Waves uh, three to as much as six feet down the south in there, again around Dixon entrance. And then for the outer Gulf Coast, we see southwest and south winds 20 to 25 knots, but waves upwards around 19 to 20 feet as you get offshore in the open waters. For the northwestern Gulf, strongest winds on Sunday will be off the Kenai, northeast of Kodiak, and lower portion of Cook Inlet. Look for east to northeast gales to 40 knots. Waves uh, 11 feet at the entrance of Cook Inlet, 15, 16 feet off the Kenai. East winds in Prince William Sound, six foot waves. And then on uh, Monday, wind's not quite as strong. We expect uh, winds out of the south-southeast for the open waters of the Gulf with waves generally 18, 19 feet. Southeast winds 20 knots, waves 3 feet in uh, Prince William Sound. And uh, winds northeasterly 10 to 20 knots going down through the lower 
uh, half of Cook Inlet with waves uh, generally around four to six feet from anchor point uh, toward the entrance. And then across uh, the southwest, including the Alaska Peninsula, Kodiak Island ahead of this frontal system, easterly gales 35 to 40 knots, waves 16 to 19 feet. Uh, we're looking at northeast gales 40 knots from Bristol Bay to north of Cold Bay, waves 7 feet out of Bristol Bay, but 16 feet there uh, north of Cold Bay. And then uh, as we go into Monday, a weak wave, low pressure, kind of a circulation around there, but winds have come down. Uh, generally 20, 25 knots from the south around Kodiak Island, southwest 25 to 30 knots on the south side of the Alaska Peninsula, and then east winds out of uh, Bristol Bay, 25 knots, waves that way five to eight feet as you get away from the ice. And then across the Aleutian chain, winds will be out of the northeast on Sunday, 30, 35 knots, at least in the eastern Aleutians, waves uh, running uh, around and just over 20 feet on the North Pacific side, but 17 to 20-ish feet there on the on the uh, bearing side, and winds will turn more uh, toward the north, northwest, uh, west of ADAC, with waves running around 19 feet. And then Monday, winds will be considerably uh, less uh, 15, 20 knots on the north side of uh, the central and eastern Aleutians and westerly, southwesterly, 20 to 25 knots uh, on the North Pacific side with waves of 11 to 16 feet. And then along the southwest coast, we have those northeast gales, uh, 40 to as high as 45 knots there, St. Matthew. The ice will continue to push south and westward. Open water still around St. Paul, St. George, 40 knot gales, waves as high as 19 feet. And then on Monday, winds either north or northeasterly, still 30 to 40 knots, uh, waves as high as 17 feet around St. Matthew, 12 feet there in the vicinity of St. Paul. And along the Arctic coast, easterly winds 20 to as high as 30 knots around Kaktovik. Again, the ice is in place there, but the lower Chuck GC, 20 to 25 knot north winds, but accelerating upwards of 35, 40 knot gales uh, south of the Bering Strait. And for Monday, we expect Northeast winds along the Arctic coast uh, at 20 knots, again with ice in place, and then as we go down through the Chukchi Sea, they accelerate 20 to 30 knots uh, there and passing through the Bering Strait, increasing to 40 knots there, especially south and west of Wales, uh, Port Clarence with the ice there in place. So that wraps up our, our marine weather for the show. Thank you for watching on this Saturday evening, and be sure to join me again Sunday night. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.